Uh, the next panel is on a topic that gets covered um, maybe far too little in Washington, D.C., the question of competition. Whether the age of our industry has gotten older, the companies have gotten larger, the competitive playing field for smaller companies have gotten more difficult, and what that means, and how or whether we should be addressing it. So to take on that very interesting and complicated set of issues, we've got a terrific panel. I'm going to bring them up right now, um, starting with uh, starting with Carol McSweeney. Uh, a, no, starting with Dr. Maya Rockimore, who snuck in behind me, uh, who who's the uh, president of Global uh, Policy Solutions. Uh, Terrell McSweeney, who's an FTC commissioner appointed by President Obama. Uh, we have uh, Chip Pickering, former congressman, and now the CEO of Encompass. By and we have uh, be right behind me Michael Beckerman, okay, cool. the president I CEO I don't, I don't like, I don't want to of the Internet Association. Okay, cool. Thanks, and sir. convening this whole conversation, we have Jillian White, senior associate editor at The Atlantic. A big uh, welcome for our panel. We are here to talk about what has not so affectionately been called the winner-take-all economy. And to just give us a little context and set us up, I wanted to give you guys a little stats about what we're looking at when we talk about market concentration. So in 2012, nearly half of all industries, the four largest firms claimed 25% of the market. Corporate profits reached a high of 9.4% of GDP during the recovery. And many say that's not because of innovation. Instead, it's because of rent-seeking and market power. And the share of the labor force employed by firms that are 16 and over is rising, and they account for nearly 75% of all workers. So the question that I have for each of you is, do we have a concentration problem? Michael, you can start with the end. Thank you. I feel like I'm so like, far removed here, but <laughs> I guess closer to the exit. Um, thanks for having me. So I think you know we represent internet companies at the Internet Association, so that's apps and websites that you visit. Um, we don't represent telcos or others, and I think when you look at our sector of the economy, it's very different than the rest of it. Um, actually, we were just chatting before we came on stage. Our association represents 40 member companies, and when we started just five years ago, we had 10. And that growth has come from brand new entrants of the market and companies that were far too small to join an association just five years ago, and then they've joined and joined. And so I think you've seen um, incredible inf uh, innovation low barriers to entry on the internet side. And actually, I brought a little bit of a prop, maybe, which um, I think will help uh, set the tone. This is an article from The Guardian from 2007. And the title of the article, Will MySpace Ever Lose Its Monopoly? <laughs> and that was 2007. I think we all know the answer to that. And I think this story of low barriers to entry, high competition, and consumer choice um, really sets the internet sector aside from maybe the rest of the economy. All right, so in your sector, you're not really. Okay. I say no. Okay. <laughs> Chip? Well, like Michael, we, we represent a lot of the internet companies and the innovators and the streamers in that space. You know, companies like Twitter and Netflix uh, and others, major internet companies, but also the small and startups, uh, companies like AngelList that match uh, startups with venture capital. But then we, we have somewhat of a unique combination is that we also represent the competitive networks, whether it's Sprint and T-Mobile and the wireless space, Level 3 and XO and, and GTT and, and Cogent and the backbone. So really the, the connection and the combination of our networks that are competitive and trying to, to drive new innovation in the network space in competition against the incumbents like AT&T, Verizon, Comcast and then the streamers and the over the top. And, and as you look at competition policy and antitrust, there's, there's some things that we believe that if you maintain them and preserve them, the con consolidation issues and the concentration in our economy can, can be protected against those trends, especially in the digital economy. And so if you look historically, 1984, who broke up AT&T? Uh, it was Ronald Reagan. If you look at the current open internet policy that was just adopted uh, by the last chairman, who gave him the blueprint to do so? Justice Scalia. And so we have on the Republican side, and sometimes it's forgotten by my, my fellow Republicans, a long history of breaking up monopolies 
creating competitive policy like we did in 1996. The 1993 competitive auctions in wireless, and if you look at and contrast, wireless industry structure of at least four compared to wired broadband where you only have usually one per market, sometimes two. If you look at the, the, the difference in innovation and lower prices and new services compared to what you have in the broadband wired market, those two contrasts, wired to wireless, is a good example of what we try to advocate for is more competition, not less. And then if you look at 1993, what, what Congress did in the, in the Cable Act, and that was to give equal access to programming to the, to the new entrant at the time, satellite versus cable. Now, all of those steps of competition policy and antitrust intervention has given us what we enjoy today, which is one of the most dynamic sectors in the digital economy, the internet economy, the networks that sustain and support that. But they're constantly being tried to, uh, there's the forces of the incumbents that are trying to roll those back and trying to move to a structure of one to two versus four or more, and in, instead of having an open internet, a closed network. So those forces and tensions within our space are critical of whether we continue to have an open, innovative, dynamic set of networks interconnected with an innovative internet economy on top of that. And so those are the critical things that we see. Charles, do we have a concentration problem? Well, um, I'll start by saying thanks for having me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am a Federal Trade Commissioner, but today I'm going to give you my individual opinion, not the official views of the FTC, nor necessarily views shared by my colleague, Acting Chairman Olhausen. And I'll say um, it depends whether we have a concentration problem. In certain sectors, in certain markets, I think we may have a concentration problem. And when it comes to that, we need aggressive antitrust enforcement and aggressive consumer protection in order to step in and make sure that those markets continue to function. Uh, Chip just set me up perfectly because I was going to say, look, we see uh, how competition, particularly in, for example, mobile wireless delivery, is really benefiting consumers and innovation. And I believe that's because we have four carriers. If we lose that and we go four to three, for example, I'd be very concerned. So I think antitrust enforcers have a huge role to play in this environment because we need to make sure that we continue to step in in markets that are highly concentrated or prevent further concentration in certain markets when they're already quite concentrated. So it depends. Yeah, Maya? I think I would agree with that, but I would also like to flip it to say that we have a, a, a small business competition problem. We're not doing enough uh, to actually support uh, business creation and sustainable business creation in this country. And I think that we can say that we are basically failing uh, our entrepreneurs in this country with regards to uh, considering the level of resources that we spend uh, at various levels of government. Uh, when you look at the data, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that you see concentration, particularly in certain industries, uh, but you're also seeing uh, the, the, the large presence of these what they call older firms, which they define as 16 and older. Uh, I don't know if you would call you know, 16 uh, granddaddy status, but it certainly is older in, in terms of the academic literature. Uh, and yet you're seeing a large number of firms that, aren't, uh, that basically don't launch, uh, or uh, th that do launch, but they are failing within their first year, uh, or within their first few years of operation. Uh, and so when you understand that, uh, you realize that uh, what we have is a structural problem in this country, and the structural problem has almost everything to do with what we're not doing uh, to successfully support sustainable businesses. Uh, and so I would say, yes, we have a concentration problem, but we also have a competition problem that can be defined in terms of what we're not doing for our small businesses. Chip and Terrell, I want you to respond to that um, in a second, because my second question has to do with the fact we have this, what seems like a little bit of a chicken and egg problem where we do not have rates of uh, business formation as high as a lot of people would like to see. We have high rates of small business and entrepreneurship failure. Is the issue that large businesses are being allowed to crowd out the space or are they expanding and taking opportunity of the inability of small businesses to form and start in the first place. What, what is the problem here? Where, how can we get to the root cause? Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, in, in our space, 
we think that if you have open net <coughs> networks and interconnected, then that allows new entrants to come in. New business models, new technologies. We believe that 5G and the deployment of fiber networks that will have to support 5G is going to create tremendous new opportunities. And as you look at everything from the Internet of Things to augmented reality to virtual reality to connected cars, the level of innovations, the layers of innovation will be tremendous. Now, you'll have new entrants that will need to introduce those ideas, and then you'll need the scale and the scope to adopt it and spread it. So in our space, we think if the current policies are preserved and maintained, that we'll con continue to see the, the great success that we've had over the last 20 years in the internet economy. But there are major proceedings underway at the FCC uh, that could roll back those protections, that could lead to a more closed open internet, a discriminatory and where small businesses and, and new entrants and new technologies want to be in, introduced, they could be blocked by the, the larger incumbents who have tremendous political influence both on the Hill and at the FCC today. So the threats to what we have known in the successful last two decades of a digital economy and then all of these new innovations that are, are pouring in on top of an open internet, those things are at risk today. I, I agree with that diagnosis. I mean, I think first and foremost, we have to adopt policies that facilitate entry and innovation, and the status quo in the United States is of an open internet, and we've seen demonstrably how successful that has been in promoting innovation. But it's also true that we, as competition enforcers, need to focus on barriers of entry. So to the extent that we have innovators that aren't um, able to enter for some reason, we ought to be very concerned about that. We ought to be concerned, obviously, about monopolization by big players as well if they have market power and one power when one market extending that into another. So we have some tools that we can use when we see these problems develop in the markets, and we absolutely should be using them. I think some of these other questions are also very important and go a little bit beyond simply competition law and mm -hmm. policy and get to important issues of access to capital mm -hmm. and, and other areas that, that are outside of my expertise but are also really important policy areas. Mm -hmm. Michael, you're saying that barriers to entry aren't as big of an issue in your industry. Do you think there's anything that there that is scalable, that is teachable when it comes to kind of trying to balance out uh, the big older businesses and kind of new startups? Yeah, I mean, I think the history, I mean, I held up the, you know, the article about MySpace and everybody laughed and, and it seems like it's obvious now, um, but at the time they were the dominant player and it's important, one, to understand the difference between the market where internet companies on the edge and apps and websites operate and where um, service providers and other areas of, of the economy operate in terms of um, barriers to entry and being able to start up a new business and market share and market power on our side in particular are not the same thing where you could have a company that has a very large market share but they don't have any real market power because you could start up a new company literally from your dorm room and unseat them and I think that history and the ability for users individuals to change sites and to click from one to another like instantly and not have market power stickiness in that way for new companies to come about is mindful for all the companies. And that's why they're constantly innovating, constantly coming up with new things, which you see more, I believe, from our companies than you do in other sectors of the economy because consumers can switch and new entrants can come up literally in a garage or a dorm room. Chip, so a little earlier, you talked a little bit about all of the things that Republicans, Republican administrations have done to kind of deal with antitrust. On the campaign trail, Trump did say that this would be something that he would want to look into. He specifically named Amazon as a potential problem. Do you think that this administration is going to move forward in kind of being more aggressive when it comes to antitrust? You know, it's too early to tell, uh, and, and the leadership of the Justice Department and the Antitrust Division are just now getting into place. Um, so the, the jury is out. But I will say this on a kind of overarching for the Trump administration. Not only when he gave this speech at Gettysburg where he, he, he talked about growing consolidation, the need uh, for more competition, where he has had the most success is when he brings in the industry executives of the insurance industry and says we need more competition and we need a, to end monopolies in states and we need to find a way to bring more competition and lower your, your prices. He uh, has greater uh, 
uh, response when he brings in the pharmaceutical industry and he says we have to do something to, to bring new products to market more quickly and bring more competition to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in our public sector, we need more choice and competition in schools or for the VA. And those themes are actually what resonate with American people. But they are very entrenched forces in this town uh, that, you know, that we all know and have friends on. Uh, and, and they are, are very reluctant to see more competition in each of their spaces. And, and that's the challenge that we face as, as advocates for more competition and a more open, interconnected network uh, system and, and policy so that we do continue to have a dynamic entrepreneurial economy versus a very co consolidated, concentrated, uh, you know, when you see the guy dragged off the, uh, the United Airlines, you know, that's some, some degree of what happens when you have less competition. The customer service goes down. The way people are treated. Uh, Governor Huckabee had a tweet about his frustration with Comcast because they just never showed up. Those are the types of frustrations that I think in some ways brought about President Trump. The consolidation and the concentration and what is perceived as the swamp or the entrenched interests protecting against competition in the marketplace. And America wants more competition, not less. Carol, do you want to respond to that? Okay, so I agree. America wants more competition, not less. Um, I think maybe where I'm, I might disagree a little bit is with some of the paths and policies that are being pursued by the administration because um, they are inconsistent with that goal in many respects. For example, uh, right away we see unilateral action to quickly favor very large incumbent companies that control internet delivery. That's not Although I would agree with you on that. Pro competitive <laughs> from my perspective, that's helping giant incumbent business interests. Um, and so I'm very concerned that, in fact, being pro-business means pro-incumbent and not being pro-market and pro-consumer. And I think both Democrats and Republicans can agree on being pro-market and pro-consumer, and we have a rich history of yes. doing so. Thank you for outlining it. But it's a little bit soon to know if this administration is really going to be pro-competition. Maya, you talked a little bit about some of the issues that arise when we have kind of aging companies, older companies, however you want to define that, 16 years or more, kind of taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, a recent Brookings paper called these companies old and fat. Um, and I think they used that term to kind of suggest that aging companies, they kind of hamper growth, and that's not really what we want to see. I'm wondering if you can talk to me about what the impact of concentration on the larger economy could be. Why are people concerned about it? Why should we care? Well, the fact, the fact of the matter is that business dynamism is what you know, spurs the economy. Uh, when you have a new entrants into the, uh, into the space uh, that are competing, it creates more creative destruction, if you will, but also opportunities, uh, wealth building opportunities uh, for the economy and also for uh, owners of firms and investors. Uh, and when you have a lack of that dynamism in the economy, you're looking at stagnant growth. Uh, you're looking at less productivity overall, and you're looking at uh, the fact that you have, of course, the problem of, of concentration, uh, which actually means a lot for the labor market as well. So, you know, you have workers that perhaps don't have as much uh, leverage with their employers, and that might translate into lower wages, more stagnant wages over time. Uh, the feeling or the inability to actually transfer jobs because you don't feel like you have, uh, you know, much cat leverage uh, to actually, uh, or space to actually make those moves. Uh, and so with that, you know, it has uh, real effects on the economy uh, that we can't ignore. Uh, and I think that's why we're having this conversation today. Sure. One of the concerns that people have had when they talk about Antitrust, when they talk about trying to deal with monopolies in the current age, is, is do we even have the framework to deal with the companies, with the Googles, with the Amazons, that are very, very different than kind of the old monopoly and trust busting initiatives that were taken on earlier? Do we have the framework? Is the framework solid enough to and adequate to take on kind of these new age companies? All right, well, 
I think this is a fascinating area, and I suspect the folks in the audience have opinions on it as well. But I'll say, um, from where I sit as an antitrust enforcer, we have a 100-year-old toolkit that has actually stood the test of time relatively well. But what we need to remember to do as enforcers is use all of the tools in the toolbox, because we can get at some of these issues, but we can be very reluctant to do so. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, I think when it comes to thinking about mergers, we need to think not just about horizontal mergers and price effects, but also innovation and quality competition when we're considering our analysis. Um, it means that we need to think about the impacts uh, in um, the monopsony effects and some of the vertical issues that are coming up as we see a lot of vertically integrated uh, companies that are already very powerful merging together. And I think the Department of Justice actually did a relatively good job developing that, that thinking um, when, they, when they thought about the, the Comcast Time Warner merger and, and developed those theories. So what's good about our antitrust toolbox is that in fact we can evolve along with dynamic markets and use the changes in the marketplace to influence our thinking um, as long as we study the trends, understand them, um, and, then, and then use them. So I think we, we have the tools, but we need to continue to keep pace with the changes and have that inform our thinking. There's some other issues that are a little bit outside of the technology space that I'm really concerned about. For example, I think we need to develop our understanding of common ownership by passive investors. These large institutional investment funds may be distorting competition in certain already very concentrated markets. We don't totally understand the mechanism for that yet, but I think it's an important area for exploration. There's also some issues associated with algorithm and, and data and technology um, that are changing or maybe affecting uh, competition, such as uh, individualized pricing, for example, um, highly effective high-velocity price discrimination that may influence how we have to think about competition going forward. But I think we have the tools to study the changes and how competition's occurring in the markets and keep pace with them. We have to be willing to use them. Michael, I'm wondering, as someone whose industry isn't necessarily suffering from the same concentration issues, how are you thinking about regulation going forward? Yeah, I mean, when you look at <clears throat> the companies that, that make up the internet, and particularly some of our, our members, um, they almost all have been born and have grown here in the United States, um, but most of the users are abroad. And so 80% of the, the jobs in economic value are here in the U US, but 80%, let's say, of internet users are abroad. And so why is that? Well, it happens to be a number of, of policy decisions that, get made, that were made long ago, maybe not anticipating the internet that we know today, um, but because of those light touch regulations and um, forward thinking of things like Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, maybe the way some um, uh, privacy rules or other things have been done here in the United States has allowed the companies to grow here in the US and be an export to the world, which has benefited our economy and benefited innovation in our, our daily lives, I'd argue. And so I would want to say that um, that should be maintained. I don't think we should change too much um, the, the, the secret sauce, let's say, that has allowed um, these companies to grow here and be an export to the world. So on that point, when we're talking about the global marketplace, I'm wondering, some people have argued that as businesses become more global, as the marketplace kind of expands and your customer base and your business base can be anywhere, perhaps there's no point in worrying so much about how concentrated the US market in particular is. I'm wondering, does anyone on that couch have a feeling about that? Is, is there any veracity to that? Well, if that's the case, then we no longer need to measure GDP. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the fact of the matter is that, you know, I, I don't have the data on uh, what percentage of these um, incumbent firms uh, are multinational. Um, it would be interesting to see. Uh, but the question about um, the, the global marketplace uh, and its impacts on the U.S. domestic economy, uh, are, I think they're very important and very real questions. Um, so, well, yeah, I just think you, you can't generalize about this at all because there are certain places in which it is a global market and uh, maybe uh, 130 different antitrust agencies are going to look at something. And then there's some uh, products and services and markets that are domestic markets. So it's hard to say it's all one thing or all the other. Uh, it certainly doesn't convince me that the presence of a global economy means that we should be doing less antitrust enforcement in the US. You know, I, my last vote in Congress was uh, the bailout after too big uh, to fail failed. And 
the, the motivation or the justification for changing a lot of our financial policies uh, in the early 2000s was around this con concept. We should concentrate our economies in the U.S. to compete globally. Well, that led to what I think was the greatest economic collapse and failure and the l largest expansion of government, if you're a conservative, in our lifetime. And that the better policy is the Reagan to Clinton bipartisan commitment to bringing competition to every sector. And I really do think as Republicans, we need to reconsider the last 15 years of the Chicago School economics of greater uh, efficiency and concentration versus our previous position of being Adam Smith capitalist, entrepreneurial capitalist, of trying to incentivize the new business, the new entrant, the small business, and being their champion, and for a more competitive economy versus a more consolidated. And if we do that, and if we set the example of an open interconnected op uh, internet, our largest engine for global exports, the internet, those policies spread around the world and we all benefit from it. And it's to our advantage to have both competition and an open internet connected both trade and technology as our policy going and the principles that kind of combine the, the best of the Democrat party of equality and the best of the Republican party freedom into a coherent policy and principle set going forward. Terrell, not that long ago, we saw the merger between Anthem and Cigna blocked. Um, as far as my reporting history goes, there's been more chatter um, about potential mergers and potentially mergers being blocked than there has been in quite some time. I'm wondering, do you think this is the beginning of the age of more scrutiny of these types of mergers? What, what is coming next for the FTC? Uh, well, um, I, I hate to generalize about this topic because I actually think um, the agencies for a while have been closely scrutinizing combinations and will continue to do that. And I, again, of course, we're at the start of a new administration, so things could change as well on that front. I certainly hope the agencies will continue to do a, a, their job when it comes to closely scrutinizing mergers that are harmful to competition. Um, and certainly, I think it's also important to note that the agencies haven't always got it right. I, I, from where I sit, I think, in fact, the agencies sometimes have been overly concerned with um, false positives and really should be more concerned about uh, stepping in and blocking certain combinations um, and allowing the markets to continue to develop um, without them uh, than they have been. Uh, you know, I think Bill Baer actually put this very well, so I'll just quote him. He said, look, we're seeing a lot of mergers that should have never gotten out of the boardroom, and it was uh, his, his antitrust division that brought that case, for example. And, and I think that's right. It may be indicative of the fact that we are dealing with a lot of markets that are highly concentrated, so we are starting to see more four to threes and three to twos coming in, um, and those quite rightly should raise concerns. Uh, I'm a big believer in the structural presumption in antitrust law. I think it's very helpful as a starting point for analysis uh, because it should make sense that when we're looking at high levels of concentration that we need to take a close look at the efficiencies and other justifications for the merger. Judge Posner himself, who is a father of the Chicago School, is a deep thinker on these issues, has said recently that he's never seen any mergers that really resulted in efficiencies that he could credit. So I think it goes to show you that there, there is a lot of debate in this space. Um, I have another quick question for our panel, but then we'll be coming to the audience for any of your questions. So if you have anything, do think about it and start raising your hand. Um, so I guess the last question I have for you guys for right now is, we focus a lot on inequality and some of the same language that we use to talk about economic inequality among individuals is the language that we use to talk about concentration in the market. And my, my question for you is, what is the risk to individual workers when industries become too concentrated, when the market becomes too concentrated and all we have is, as Brookings said, these big old fat companies? All right, less bargaining power, um, uh, you know, less, uh, Purchasing power overall, uh, more stagnant wages, um, less opportunities to transfer jobs. Um, uh, and, and in fact, the data actually bears that out. Um, so you, um, you know, despite all of the news stories about millennials changing jobs every every year, or every other year, which they seem to do in Washington D.C., <laughs> um, the data about the overall broader economy is that there's not a lot of movement uh, between firms uh, in terms of the the labor market. Uh, so you're seeing more settling in place, if you will. Um, 
And, and that creates, you know, that, that creates a situation where um, workers and their families uh, uh, aren't as economically, uh, I think, dynamic as they could be. There's also, if I could just jump in, I mean, a role here, we have some occupational licensing that could be, I think, deemed overly restrictive in some areas, so we get, get very concerned about that at the FTC. Mm -hmm. And then there are situations in which you actually see employers more or less colluding to suppress uh, job change and, and, and wage growth, and we've brought some cases as antitrust agencies in the past regarding those including last year issuing a resource guide to human resource officers mm -hmm. about their antitrust law responsibilities, which was relatively unprecedented. And I just want to add, uh, you know, union busting. <laughs> Unions don't have much bargaining power because of the concentration as well. I think we had a few audience questions. Mm -hmm. You can go right over there. Hi, this is Stas from the Cambridge Innovation Center. So you guys have talked a lot about competition in connection with company-to-company -company competition, so large company versus small company, medium versus medium. Um, it, it's been talked a little bit about earlier, but you guys haven't talked at all about non-compete agreements and the restrictive nature of them. Do you think that there is um, national action? We've seen sort of state-by-state -state attempts at reform. I'm from Massachusetts, and for the last couple of cycles, we failed to change our non-compete law due to some pretty heavy lobbying from existing large-scale companies. Do you think there is a role, so one, is there an FTC role for that? Um, because if there's an enforcement against companies, um, you know, Uber saying you can't go work for Apple, you know, is there, um, in, in, in Uber and Apple agreeing at the corporate level not to post each other as employees as opposed to non-compete agreements, do you think there's a non-compete agreement version that you guys will look at at the federal level about it in a way that stops or certain competition? Well, I'm personally concerned about non-compete uh, clauses, especially if they're overly restrictive. Plus, we see them in use in a lot of industries where they really don't seem justified. So I think the, the key question here is, is what is the justification for this kind of contract pr provision, and, and when should we allow it, if ever? I think it's an important policy area, certainly one that I care deeply about. Um, I don't control the agenda at the FTC, so I can't speak for, for where it will go in the future. but. My colleague, Acting Chairman Olhausen, has embraced the idea of our Economic Liberty Task Force, which is looking at occupational licensing restrictions and whether those are overly broad in some situations. And I think this kind of work could easily fit within that framework. It's a liberty thing. Do we have a question right back there? Yes. Um, on <coughs> the discussion of trade agreements, globalization, and competition, do you think that the proposals for the United States to become less involved in these trade agreements and uh, either pull out or uh, renegotiate and um, cut down the competition from imports? Will that lead to more competition in the United States or will that lead to more oligopolies and monopolies growing up within the national economy? I think um, <clears throat> as it relates to trade agreements, there are certainly opportunities. Um, as it relates to digital trade, when you look back to NAFTA, for example, um, that was before the days of, of the internet as we know it today or at all, really. Um, and so there's certainly policy provisions that could be put into a new agreement like that or some others that would benefit um, companies in the United States and, and certainly exports. And, and I, I think the more competitive America is, the more competitive we, we will be overseas as well. And, and so they shouldn't be uh, either or uh, or incompatible uh, of you. And, and our companies and what we uh, are able to, to create. Uh, we would not like to see concentration in America in a way that takes away our dynamic, innovative advantages that we've historically had. It's, it's an American distinctive, and we're defined by having a competitive, dynamic culture, democracy, and economy. And we really can't afford to lose that. It depends on what the agreement is. I think and I, I, would, I would hope the goal would be for more competition and trade, not less. We have time for one more question right over there. Yeah, let me make uh, two points. Um, both political parties in the late 60s and 70s, especially uh, when Carter was president, pursued policies of increasing competition in industries like telephones, AT&T, uh, and then you had you know, trucking, 
railroads. Paul, well, I apologize. We, we have one minute. So in your two points, I just want you to do it short form. <laughs> okay. Airlines, every area, we opened up the area to competition, and the result was much lower inflation. The second point would be about unions. In every one of these cases, the companies and the unions were together, and they wanted to maintain. Whoa. Did I do that? <laughs> the companies and the unions together wanted to maintain the monopolies or the cartels in the area. That's AT&T and its union, truckers and their union. They all wanted to keep the the limitations on competition because unions depended, union power depended on the power of the companies to set prices. So I think this is an area where you're exactly wrong. Unions or the working people in these companies are much stronger when there's a monopoly. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much. Big, big thank you to uh, Chip Pickering, Maya Rockymore, Michael Beckerman, Terrell McSweeney, and my colleague and friend Jillian White. Thank you all very, very much.